use complications hands up in my eyes. to test our theories. And but you still need the theories to test. You still need the theories to test. Well, sometimes. Oh, yes. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome back uh, to Helix Center. This is uh, roundtable number four in our series on coding in a new human phenotype. The topic for uh, today's talk is our natural language generators for real. We've uh, uh, got have a wonderful panel of, of uh, experts to talk to us about this and talk us through this. Um, if you didn't see any of the three talks from yesterday, I really do recommend uh, you take a look at them on YouTube, where if you look up Helix Center, uh, you'll find them. Uh, they were really were terrific. So I want to, without further ado, go on and, and uh, uh, give a brief bio of each of our esteemed uh, panelists. First, Francesca Rossi is an IBM fellow and the IBM AI ethics global leader. She is based at the TJ Watson IBM Research Lab in New York, where she leads AI research projects. She co-chairs the IBM AI Ethics Board, and she participates in many global multi-stakeholder initiatives on AI ethics, such as the Partnership on AI, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations ITU AI for Good Summit, and the Global Partnership on AI. She is the president of AAAI, the Worldwide Association of AI Researchers. Dennis Yi Tenen is an associate professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University. His teaching and research happen at the intersection of people, texts, and technologies. A longtime affiliate of Columbia's Data Science Institute and formerly a Microsoft engineer and a Berkman Center for Internet and so Society Fellow, his code runs on millions of personal computers worldwide. Tenen received his doctorate in comparative literature at Harvard University under the advisement of Professor Elaine Scarry and William Todd, a co-founder of Columbia's Group for Experimental Methods and Humanistic Research and the editor of the On Method book series at Columbia University Press. He is the author of Plain Text, The Poetics of Computation, 2017. Kyung Young Cho is an associate professor of computer science and data science at New York University and CIFAR fellow of learning in machines and brains. He is also a senior director of Frontier Research at the prescient design team within Genentech Research and Early Development. He was a research scientist at Facebook AI Research from June 2017 to May 2020 and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Montreal until the summer of 2015 under the supervision of Professor Yashua Bengio after receiving his PhD and MSc degrees from Alto University in April 2011 and April 2014 respectively under the supervision of Professor Yuha Carhonen. Catherine Elkins has written over a dozen articles on memory, consciousness, and embodied aesthetic experience in a wide range of writers from Plato and Sappho to Wordsworth and Wolf. In Proust's In Search of Lost Time, Philosophical Perspectives, she reframed Proust's exploration of consciousness in light of integrated information theory. In The Shape of Stories, she used the AI software, Sentiment Arcs, to develop the first robust methodology for exploring the emotional arcs of stories. Her audible.com lectures on the giants of French literature and the mo modern novel have won her an international audience. Noah Jean Syracuso, PhD in math from Brown University, is an assistant professor of mathematics and data science at Bentley University. Noah's research interests include algebraic geometry, uh, the abstract study of systems of polynomial equations and their solutions, machine learning, especially topological and geometric data analysis, artificial intelligence, empirical legal studies, phylogenetics, and misinformation. Ned Block is Silver Professor of Philosophy, Psychology, and Neuroscience, 
came to NYU in 1996 from MIT, where he was chair of the philosophy program. He works in philosophy of mind and foundations of neuroscience and cognitive science, and is currently writing a book on attention. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the Cognitive Science Society, has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Language and Information, a Sloan Foundation Fellow, a faculty member at two National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institutes and two summer seminars. The recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council on Learned Societies and the National Science Foundation, and a recipient of the Robert A. Mu Alum Alumni Award in Humanities and Social Science from MIT. He is a past president of the Society for Philosophy and Psychology, a past chair of the MIT Press Cognitive Science Board, and past president of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. Okay, that's <laughs> quite a mouthful. Anyway, speaking of mouthful, so we're going to be uh, talking today about uh, language uh, generate, uh, artificial language generator and what that means for us uh, in our near and more distant future. So welcome, everyone. <clears throat> Okay, so apparently all I need to do is start to say a few words, and you're all going to fill in the rest. Uh, the, the, way natural, uh, the, the way the natural language generators work, as some of you may know, is that uh, after giving given a prompt of a few words, an entire story will come out like in remembrance of, uh, uh, in search of lost time. So um, I wonder if any of you want to take a shot at giving a general orientation to our general audience about what, for example, the GPT-3 generator is and what we might expect from it in its future uh, iterations. I can give it a start and then people can chime in. So, so until a few years ago, uh, artificial intelligence was uh, becoming very good at uh, interpreting content that we were producing, like images and text and other content. Um, so natural language generators are instead uh, the most recent advances of AI where AI is becoming good also at generating new content rather than just interpreting the content that we are producing. And in order to do that, this, uh, and, and I'm saying this content and not text because it's not limited to text, but it can also be videos, it can also be images, for example. So different kinds of data, that is content that is generated. Uh, so it's so-called generative AI. So AI that can generate new content besides being able to interpret content that we uh, produce. And the way, I mean, this, I leave out a lot of details, but the way it, it can do that is by being trained on vast amounts of data, uh, unlabeled data is called, so data that is found on the web without any, um, any curation from human beings, any labeling is called from human beings, so this uh, data that is found on the web in vast amounts, um, that that is used to train these AI systems, uh, and for example text, that is found on the web, that is trained to use these AI systems that then can, uh, again, as you said, you know, uh, respond to a prompt in an appropriate way. Uh, this data is the source of knowledge, if you wanted knowledge, of the system, um, but there is also knowledge that is given in the prompt itself. So there is an area called prompt engineering because uh, writing a prompt, also the way you write the prompt or how long the prompt is or what you put in the prompt can also trigger a different, uh, more informative or less informative response from the natural language generator. And and uh, if I now put the heart of a company like IBM or others, they may want to use this for some applications. Uh, one possibility to use them is to take them as a trained by these vast amounts of data and then further tune them with supervised and labeled data on a specific task to but very little amount of data 
to solve a specific task, but with the general knowledge that is given by this initial phase of training over vast amounts of data. And this allows you to have a specialized solver for one particular problem, but with this more general knowledge, which is needed usually to solve well even a specific task, and especially when the kind of label data that you need for a specific task is not is kind of limited. So you have a you just need a little bit of this label data for the specific task because you rely on this vast amount of general, let's say, data. So that's some initial thing, but feel free to chime in. I, I would add that, uh, I mean, I think the probably the most important thing for many listeners to realize is just how amazing the productions of some of these um, programs have been. Um, uh, I think, you know, they've been so incredible that two years ago, nobody would have predicted that they could, or three years ago. So GPT-3 came out in 2020. Um, so a little over, so around three years ago. So, uh, uh, well, at, at the time of GPT-2, um, I don't think anybody would have predicted what they can do. It's just really, if you haven't seen any of these, like there's been a couple articles in the New York Times, et cetera, it's kind of amazing. Um, but it's important to realize what they're good at and what they're not good at. So what they're good at is open-ended context where there's no spe very specific right answer, where what counts is style and creativity. That's what's kind of amazing, creativity. These things are good, at the, they're the opposite of what everybody would have expected. They're t so they're really good at it. So, for example, the New Yorker published a, a poem in the style of Philip Larkin. Uh, it was actually pretty good. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, people can get them to, you know, com uh, write news articles and, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, give interviews in the style of a particular person. With, with the right fine tuning that uh, Francesca m mentioned. Um, so that's kind of amazing. I think that's the first thing to realize is that it's just how um, astonishing they, they really are. But the second thing is the severe difficulties. So the main, well, one really bad severe difficulty is that they have, as been pointed out by many people, no world model. So they just continue a style in a certain way um, and with ignoring the actual facts. Um, uh, so they'll spin a, a web of, of, of uh, text uh, along a certain line, but then it can just completely contradict what's, what's really true, even though you could get the real information from Siri or Google search so importantly, uh, Francesca mentioned this, but they don't actually, I mean, you can add a Google search to one of these large language models, but it's, then you have a problem with the interface. So in, in just the operation of the large language models, they don't have access to the internet. They're trained on the internet, you know, with enough electricity to power a small city, and then you can run the trained model on a smaller computer but they don't actually have the ability to look things up. So you'll get a better answer from Siri than you will from them. Um, now, with all their failings, people have tried to hook up more standard systems to them, and then there's the issues of how that interface is supposed to, supposed to work. So the big negatives are no world model, um, in the, in the generation of language, no understanding of long-range dependencies. Um, so, um, you know, some of their critics have been fond of pointing out that the, they treat words as just like a stream uh, without getting the hierarchical structure. And there was a, a paper that came out, I, I believe, just yesterday by Stan de Haan's laboratory looking at short-range dependencies and long-range dependencies with a relative clauses. So um, the case, the example they used, I think, was uh, the key, um, uh, uh, the short range would be the key is green. 
or the key the man had is green. And then you keep adding relative clauses, like the key that the man in the corner had was green. And as soon as you get to fairly long relative clauses, forget it. They don't know which things did what to whom. Um, so, but that is a general feature of their uh, not understanding the structure of, of language. And language is what they're made for, but they keep getting things wrong. And then the real, I guess the, the most significant issue is, so, you know, some people think, okay, you just need bigger ones. Um, and then others think, no, there's something really principled missing. And that, I think that's the key debate. Mm -hmm. Another thing they're really bad at is um, logic and arithmetic. Again, like the opposite of what people think. So I think, you know, people in the, um, who aren't familiar with the, these things have to realize they're quite different from their strengths are different from what everybody would have expected, and their weaknesses are especially different mm -hmm. from what everybody would have expected. So it's a pretty, pretty peculiar thing. And you know, for me, I, I'm more interested in the mind than I am in lots of other things. And I want to know what does that tell us about the mind? <laughs> I mean, I can actually put something on top of that. Is that the so one of the issues I, I see, you know, the, us looking at all these amazing language generators like the GPTs and whatnot, is the fact that they, they are doing something amazing, which is very obvious, because we can just see them doing amazing stuff, but the, uh, we actually don't know exactly you know, how those amazing things are happening. So that just pointed out the creativity, which is amazing, right? So these things are actually creating something new that it has not seen before during training time. And then in the term of the machine learning, that's called generalization. So how can these models be able to do something that it, or it was not trained on ex explicitly? And then how it happens in the statistical sense is that it, it does all those counting of all the patterns they see during training. And then what it does is that because it has a limited capacity, it needs to compress all the things that it has seen. And then while doing so, it loses some information. But the information lost is the information gained on the things that it has not seen before. And then what are these you know, the new patterns that these compression mechanism or the training algorithm are actually focusing on that we find really amazing. So the process of, let's say, generation, uh, generalization or the creativity by compression is a complete mystery at the moment. A lot of people, you know, a lot of theoret uh, theoreticians actually do work on it from the perspective of, well, is there some kind of, let's say, implicit, let's say, regularization happening? That is, you regularize how learning happens and thereby encouraging these models to do something that it has never seen before. And you know, the, how does that actually connect to the amazing nature of the generalization of the creativity that we see? And then this lack of our understanding of these very s simple fundamental things. Essentially, we're saying that they will, these models are counting and compressing. And somehow, magically, thereby, it does generalize to a completely unseen or the new things that look amazing to us. So what is this, right? It's a very simple thing, right? The question is like out there, but we have absolutely no idea what is the even right way to approach answering the question. Now, let's stop for a second about the word creativity. I mean, there's so many different yeah. branches to, you know, to look into, and we'll hopefully do that. It's amazing. Uh, so I'm going to stop about the word creativity because let's stop and imagine that I would prefer we use creativity as demonstrated by these as like creativity with an asterisk and not assume right off the bat that it's creativity is it's the same property that we have or, uh, we instantiate when we're being creative uh, is it just a very advanced way of being a, a dancing bear are these very very clever <clears throat> things that do wow us because I didn't think a computer could write something inventive like that. And how deeply does it go? And, and as, as you were saying, Ned, in some ways, what does it mean about the mind and creativity in humans? So does anyone want to take a, a little whack at that? I, I think it's helpful to, to zoom in for a second on the training process itself. So we talked about how it scans this text. It's actually a very simple process that it's undertaking while it does this. It doesn't read the text, but as it processes the text, the computer algorithm just um, masks or it sort of hides random words and it, acts, it asks the, the neural network to try to predict the missing words. And that's the whole process. It just reads along. So imagine I'm talking to you and I say, my dog likes to blank. Everyone in this room, I'm sure inside your head, you heard sort of an auto-completion. Right. Maybe my dog likes to play, my dog likes to walk. 
And that's all we're asking the computer to do. We give it some text, or it reads some text, and then it tries to predict the next word, the missing words. And as it does that, it just develops this process of being able to predict the next word. And I think, um, tying into some of the earlier things as far as like how it's surprisingly bad at things like arithmetic and logic, when you think about that process, of course it is. It, it'll do well at things like what is, you can prompt it and ask it what's two plus three. Well, because it's seen that in training text, so it can predict the answer is five. But if you give it more complicated numbers that it hasn't seen, it's a little bit, I think, like uh, some children learn to spell by memorizing the spelling of words rather than phonetics. And this, this algorithm is very much the non-phonetic version. It's just memorizing a bunch of correlations and patterns without developing that understanding. What's surprising, I think, is that it does have some hints of understanding that it shouldn't from such a basic process. And going back to your, your question about creativity, I think one thing that's helpful to think is, you know, if, if you have your phone and you, you start typing a text message and it, and it suggests words, you can just keep clicking those buttons. You're basically running something like GPT-3. Based on the text that's there, it'll just sort of randomly predict the next word. It's very improvisatory, so I think it helps to think a little bit maybe like jazz, where by nature, it's just kind of rambling and improvising and making up as it goes which actually can make it seem more creative than a very structured, rigid thing where it's trying to articulate and express an idea. It doesn't have the idea, but it can just kind of wing it and improvise words, which I think gives it a kind of like local aspect of creativity, but not the global. There's not a creative idea it's expressing, but the wordings are creative for the, the lack of idea that it has. Well, this may be a little bit of what, you, as you said earlier, and Ed, if you follow it long, long enough, it, sort of, it seems to go off the track a little bit, right? Yeah, well, it completely changed persona, et cetera. But, you know, your, your question suggested that we're amazed at how creative it is for a machine. I don't think that's right. I can't write a poem in the, in the style of Philip Larkin. I can't draw the amazing pictures it draws. And the other things that it, it, it does also are, can be well beyond what many people can do. I mean, it explains jokes, for example. It looks, The Economist published a, a series of, 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 of little bits of, of where they showed in The Economist covers. They explained the covers. I mean, it did a, it did a really good job. Of, uh, uh, I don't remember which system it was, but um, uh, it, it did an amazing job. At the same time, that same issue, The Economist had a wonderful little article by Douglas Hofstadter where it asks questions like, um, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the last time, when will the next time that Egypt be transported over the Golden Gate Bridge? <laughs> <laughs> and it gave an answer assuming that Egypt could be transported over the Golden Gate Bridge. So that's the lack of a world model. So creativity, I, I think it's, I mean, look, I don't know how to define creativity. It isn't what we do, probably, but um, it's, pr it's very, very Im impressive, combined with these utter lacks of logic, reasoning, and a world model. So, Can I kind of push back on this word amazing that we keep using? Is that so my, so my work specifically with language generating is historical. And some of the earliest materials that I found were uh, so uh, Ramon Lully, or Ramon Yui, was a medieval, uh, medieval Mallorcan theologian who created these um, paper machines that were uh, pr prototype language, simple combinatorial language generators, where you rotate the circles and combine all possible truths about God. And that work and those devices were so amazing, in a sense, and so kind of uh, unreasonably effective that it spawned a number of cults all across Europe who are Lullian, Lullian sort of theologians, Lullian poets, that persisted for centuries. And, and I think they asked some of the same questions that we are asking of these somewhat more sophisticated tools. But the thing is, this kind of, uh, kind of creativity that's combinatorial, that's mathematical, that's statistically driven, has been with us for a very, very long time. It's just we tend to kind of forget that history and then rediscover those devices and be amazed again and kind of be discomforted again by their presence in our midst. So that's where I would a little bit say, like, well, you know, what, you know, is this, is this a new kind of phenomenon or is this something that we're continually struggling with? 
I will say we were teaching an uh, earlier form of deep learning that would generate text, and it worked pretty poorly. It was somewhat word salad. It seemed creative, but it didn't really make sense all the time. And I still remember the day that GPT-2 came out, and we started working with it with students, and we taught it to write like Oscar Wilde and like Chekhov and like all these writers, and do things exactly as you said that my students have trouble with. I asked them, okay, you read Virginia Woolf. Write a passage like Virginia Woolf. You know, they, they can't, right? And so that's more of X paradox, right? That it can do things that are very difficult for us, but it can't do things that are easy, right, for us. And so people get very confused about it because they say, oh, it can't do this, right? And therefore, it's dumb. But it's part of that paradox. And even in terms of counting, people have found that it counts like little children count, right, as they're learning to count. Um, so if you haven't worked with it, it, it can be kind of hard to understand because you think, how can this work? The other thing that I would say is for decades, people wanted to teach computers how to process language and generate language based on rules, right? This was Chomsky's universal grammar. And we thought if we just gave it enough rules and enough edge cases, somehow that would work. And it really hasn't worked well at all. And no one really expected that if we just gave it a massive amount of language, it would be able to do such a phenomenal job. So we're all still trying to figure out what does that mean? And what does that mean about how language works? And what does that mean about the nature of meaning? And what does it mean about the nature of our own mind and creativity? So it has a lot to teach us, but it doesn't fit neatly into human categories. And, and that's kind of what we're experimenting with right now, to try to figure out how does it work? And what does this mean? Yeah, in my view also, I mean, connecting also to what uh, was said earlier, you know, many of this uh, uh, behavior that we see as amazing, uh, mm -hmm. historically you say that this happened many times, uh, are, uh, as you say, a bit cherry-picked. Because, you know, then you generate a lot of different texts uh, from a prompt, uh, and some of them are amazing, and some of them are amazing in the negative and wrong way, you know, because it's completely out of track. So, so uh, we have to be aware that... Uh, there is no real reliability there. Uh, so there is a problem with reliability, and, uh, and then uh, there is also a problem connected, you know, going back to creativity, is how do we want to use these systems, you know, to replace human creativity or to augment and support and expand human creativity? Um, like my, one of my recent um, talks I used, I did this, PowerPoint slides, all the pictures in my PowerPoint slides were generated with DALI, which is a, not a text generator, but an image generator from a textual description of a scene. So all my images were, they were generated using this algorithm, and they were beautiful. And I was, you know, oh my God, you know. Like, but then at the end I said, okay, wait a minute, I didn't... Uh, use any graphic designer, I didn't pay any copyright because you own the images that you generate with Ali. Um, so what does that mean if everybody would do like that? Uh, then graphic designer would be out of a job, uh, that would be possible consequences and that's maybe economically in their business model is going to be a damage for them. But most importantly, if everybody would do like that, what would happen to the creative process, not the outcome, but the process of creation that society needs to have and people need to have. If you have a society where nobody follows the creative process anymore, then what kind of society is that going to become? So really the question about how we want to use these uh, um, uh, these, these new techniques and, and uh, we, within our society. So we have to be more conscious about, uh, besides being excited about the novelty of the thing, which maybe is not really a novelty, as you said, uh, but also about more conscious about how we want them to be embedded in our job or in our interaction with each other, in our creative process and so on. So, what is the role of this technological progress, for example, by these techniques, in the progress of society? So let me also give you another historical anecdote that may answer a little bit. You know, we can look back and see how did we deal with, with this before. So um, in my book that's, that's upcoming, I talk a lot about the previous sort of flourishing of te text generators, which may surprise you, was 
late 19th, early 20th century, which were exactly the template-based generators, where, which work like this Mad Libs, you know, something, something blank, fill in the likely blank, and there were uh, devices and charts and tables that were used on a massive scale to generate movie plots, to generate theater plays. Today, when you're looking, you know, at the Netflix show, it's the, the practice of using template generators um, of, you know, a particular lineage that go back to like the plot genie. And these were like best-selling, best-selling writer aids books that are completely integrated in contemporary writing, creative writing programs, right? And what they've res they have contributed to the mass production of art. You know, so if we think about the flourishing of art in the 20th century and the massive art, popular art, it's kind of completely integrated a particular form of writing. You know, when you see it early on, if people are actually saying like, okay, we need, I need to write more. I need to sell more little, you know, like a pulpy, pulpy plots to the magazines. I need to sell more pulpy plots to the, to the Hollywood studio. And they and we are living in a kind of uh, cultural environment where uh, this algorithmic, combinatorial, template-based, a little bit maybe statistical to a lesser extent, but is very well integrated to our processes. But to the extent that we, we don't normally see it, right? When you see that those credits roll at the end of a Netflix show, you're not thinking like, oh, did, wait, wait a second, they didn't actually invent this. They, you know, did they use a particular, you know, like writer's aid that helped them in some like unfair and creative ways? But there are like that. complaints that a plot seems formulaic, or it seems you could people can perceive that from time to time. Like this, this plot yeah. seems to have been written by a computer, for example. I wanted to follow again along this idea of the, what, what sorts of creativity are these different sort of properties or categories. Uh, amazement, and that's been mentioned a lot. So when you look at art, visual art, and maybe it's easier in visual art to come up with this, we have a history of being amazed by certain masters of art. So uh, Da Vinci draws something and it looks amazing. We Part of our amazement is, how did he do that? Well, what, was the, what was the manual, in the dexterity, and, the, and whatever else goes into it? I, I'm not equipped to say all the things that go into it, but I do know that the human factor is absolutely a part of what amazes me and most of us. Now, when a computer generates a Da Vinci-like sketch, it's not doing the same thing. And we might say, oh, it's amazing, because wow, what an incredible facsimile. But it, doesn't, it didn't do the steps that amazed us historically, what, what historically accounted for our amazement in seeing art. So that's the, the, that, I think, expresses the difference between sort of formulaic and algorithmic generated creativity and the creativity that we're accustomed to. And is that something that's going to be bridged at some point? Let me push back a bit on that. Is that the, yes, uh, some of this is a very basic principles on top of which we have built these large scale language models have been here for centuries. And in particular, you know, if you read the book from 1950 by Paul Shannon, in fact, we actually do see the perplexity as well as the low probability and how we want to actually maximize the low probability of the correct following words, given all the context in order to, in fact, model the distribution. Of, it's all written there, yes, that's true. But that doesn't necessarily imply that if we are only relying on them in order to build these large-scale language models, to build them, and in fact, I was one of those people who actually built the very large ones in the first place. And it takes a lot more so than simple principle of counting and compression. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. There are a lot of, let's say, ways in which we can parameterize. So you know, why everyone is going crazy about transformer, which was only uh, proposed about five years ago, is because it took us half a century to get to that point in order to come up with all those simpler, simple but algorithmic techniques and tricks that we had to develop. And then all these optimization algorithms that we use. Yes, we can go all the way back to again 52 or so to talk about the stochastic gradient descent and so on, but to figure out the, what are the right way to use, do the optimization took us another, let's say, half a century. So what that means is that the, what is amazing is not the fact that, okay, these are template-based, let's say, generators that have done amazing compression of the amazing amount of data that looks to do something amazing, but how we were able to actually build this. So it's actually not that different from, let's say, you know, being amazed by, let's say, all those monsters. 
it is doing something really, really amazing inside that we don't know, understand how it's doing it. Probably not in the way that human masters are doing, but still it is doing something that we didn't know and that we still don't know exactly how it's doing. So I think we're supposed to be amazed by this. Now, of course, amazed, and we have to try to figure out how not to be amazed as well, yes. And that's, I guess, our job, but yes. So connected to this, I mean, I think that uh, the fact that this is kind of a black box, that we don't know how it generates this output from the prompt, um, also uh, leads us to, so computer science, coding, programming, computer science and AI used to be a discipline where you, the researcher, the, the, the software engineer, the programmer, were having some goal in mind for a machine to do that, and then you were coding that, right? So, and then there were uh, verification, validation techniques, and so on, but you knew what the machine was going to do, you know? So, and then you would check that it would do it, it didn't put any bug, and so on. Now, instead, so that was the computer science exact science kind of approach. Now it's m becoming, with data-driven approaches, more like of a natural science. So you build this thing, but you don't know how it works, and then you start experimenting and testing, you develop some hypotheses, and then you test whether the hypothesis is true or not. So it become, becomes closer to being a natural science rather than a computer science, right? So, so it's, it's now merging these two approaches in, that were typical of these two kinds of uh, sciences and disciplines because of the nature of these machines that we build, but we don't know how they work. So then we treat them as uh, we treat the laws of, you know, the laws of physics. You know, that we try to find some properties of what we built because we don't know how they are going to behave. I think that's why don't we know? Sorry, what we, what we don't know? Uh, why don't we know? Why? Why don't we know? Um, so, I mean, the, I try to answer the question myself every day. So, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the reason why we don't know uh, how these things work is almost by construction. As, as just you've just pointed out, is that the, so there are problems, small subset of problems that we know how to solve by specifying what we want to do. And then that's you know, what the traditional computer science has focused on over the past, let's say, uh, centuries, right? And then you know, there is a slightly bigger subset of the problems for which we know the nature or the evolution has figured out how to solve the problem. So you know, for instance, us driving, right? So any person you take, give them 20 hours of the driving lesson, we know that person will be able to drive in the New York City without any issue. So there, there's a subset of the problems where we know solution exists, but we don't know how to implement the solution or the implement the solution. And then for, and then there's a slightly bigger subset of the problems where we don't yet know whether nature or evolution or the universe has figured out an answer to. But that you know we want to solve those problems because so if you solve those problems, it's going to be very very practical and whatnot. And then, of course, there's a bigger set of problems where maybe uh, there's not even a solution to start with. But then you have the machine learning, or the it's kind of the say AI, uh, is there to solve the slightly larger subset of the problems that we were, we are not even supposed to know how to answer, but we know that the solution exists, and we are going to build an algorithm to come up with a solution to that one. So you know, in, in a sense, if we knew how the solutions that were given out by these machine learning or the AI algorithms were working, then we probably would not have needed AI or yeah. machine learning. So let, let me give also an oversimplified view of my answer to your question. So when you know how to solve a problem, you can uh, define a, an algorithm, which just means a sequence of steps. So you do this, and then you do this, like a recipe. No? You take the ingredients, then you mix uh, the eggs and the, you know, whatever, and then you do this and you do this, and in the end you get what you wanted as a result. So if you know how to solve a problem in that way, you code these steps into, you know, with whatever programming language you have, you put this into a machine, and the machine will follow those steps. So then you don't have a problem of not knowing how the machine goes to the result, because the machine followed exactly the steps that you told them, 
to, f to get to the result. But when you don't have these algorithms, uh, very clearly algorithms to find a result of a pro the solution to a problem, like in you know, recognizing a face of a person or uh, driving or whatever, this, you don't have this very uh, recipe, very nice recipe, because there are so many variables to consider, so many uncertain, so much uncertainty and so on. So what you do, you just give a lot of examples of problems and solutions problems and solutions. And then they let the machine learn from these examples by looking at the, the, the problem, finding something in output, and if the output is different from the solution that you gave, just modifying a little bit the parameters so that the, uh, the distance between the two is smaller. And then with the next problem, next problem, next problem. So at the end, you get the machine that by testing it, it behaves rather well in that problem of finding a solution. But you don't know, you, don't, you cannot see, there is no sequence of steps that tells you what the machine is doing exactly, how to solve the problem, because there is no sequence of steps. As he was saying, if there were a sequence of steps to solve the problem, you would use it, and you would not use these other algorithm. But to recognize a face, for example, there is no one sequence of steps that you can use. So you have to use this other approach, but then you're not sure exactly what comes out and why it comes out. Let me, let me get an illustration of how little we understand. So all the big famous successes have been driven by a machine architecture called the transformer architecture. Um, so, uh, um, however, so, you know, I think initially people thought, well, look, it's this architecture that's really responsible for all this stuff. But now it looks like people are moving towards getting similar successes using other architectures. So it's not even clear that it is the transformer architecture that is really responsible for the big successes. So I think what she said about um, natural science, it is much more like a natural science now. You can build the successful models. But understanding what they're doing is like we're examining it, like we examine the nature of atoms or something. So it's a it's a real puzzle. Well, we don't know how we ride a bike. Real, I mean, in, in the in the sense in which we don't understand computers and how they figure out problems, we don't know how we ride a bike. I mean, we know we train ourselves. Careful with that, because right. you know there are things that sound similar yeah. where they, there is a real simple al algorithm, like catching a fly ball. Right, I was going to say that. There's yeah. a stateable algorithm. Yeah. It seemed mysterious, like riding a bike. And right. There was, turns out there was a stateable algorithm. But g following along with Francesca's idea, it required natural science investigations to come up with that solution, because the person on the street who rides a bike or the outfielder who catches a pop fly can't tell you, well, this is how my brain figures it out, right? It's, it's a scientific um, problem to look into, right? And, so another yeah. example like that is chicken sexing. So for many years, that was, you know, so you... I thought you, that was illegal. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you used to have these, uh, there was a school in Chicago actually called the Chicago School of Chicken Sexing. And the problem was you had these baby chicks, but you didn't know whether they were hens or going to grow up to be hens or roosters. So com for commercial purposes, you need to separate them. And for, for years, there were these trained people who did it, and nobody knew how they did it. And somebody did, you know, play, investigated a little more, and they figured out exactly what they were doing, and now they have a very simple method of figuring it out. So you can have a lot of things that people can do through training. And you don't understand them, and then if you investigate, sometimes you understand them. And that may well happen with these machines. We, we, you know, if we get many different architectures that can do the same thing, look, it could turn out yep. that the fundamental basis is just prediction. That, you know, people didn't used to think that the way the mind worked was so heavily reliant on prediction, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it, it, for some years now, there's, there's people who study perception, not cognition, but perception, have been focusing on prediction. Maybe that's the key here, is that however you can do the prediction, that's what makes the thing run. If I can just add to that, so what we've been doing in the lab for a number of years is precisely this kind of experiment, and it is extremely tricky. 
um, because it is sampling from this distribution of probability, but you can actually tune it to get more surprise or less surprise. It doesn't work like a Google search. So many times when our students start to work with it, they think it's going to work just like using Google search. In fact, the interface is very different because it's going to continue with whatever you give it. If you give it very general language, it won't give you anything back except generalities. You have to give it the texture. You have to think about language in terms of complexity in order to get it to give you that complexity back. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and then you have to think, if you train it to write like a writer, how long do I train it? You can overtrain it. You can undertrain it. So you're in this entire search space. And then there's a question of how many times do you try it? Do you try it 100 times? And, and how do you figure that out? So it's actually extremely difficult even to experiment with it. And just to give you an example, we created this diva bot, an AI that uh, the improv. And we worked with uh, an actress in LA. And she had a very difficult time doing improv in the typical way, which is that you give a kind of general response to your uh, fellow improv improviser so that they can do something cool with it. Well, if you give a general prompt to the AI, it gives a general prompt back. She had a better time giving very specific things, like she was comforting a crying baby, and I hope I can say this on YouTube. Uh, she says, how do I stop my crying baby? Well, the diva bot, the GPT-2, which is a fairly small model, said, wear a condom. <laughs> <laughs> is that creative? <laughs> You may have to delete that. I apologize. <laughs> no way. No way. Too good. And we'll ask the computer to explain why that was so funny. <laughs> well, it can do that too. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, if we can go back to the question of not knowing and, and kind of, I, I feel like we were talking about slightly different forms of not knowing. So there is not knowing, there's a part inside of the process. And there, there's a part w which we can't quite explain. And that doesn't seem to me that unusual. So there's plenty of engineering solutions where we sort of know that they work and we design them. But like, if, if you, so for example, like flash memory. Mm -hmm. uh, flash memory works by quantum tunneling. Mm -hmm. If you ask somebody like, show me exactly how did the electron penetrate the blah blah, blah you can't. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's unpredictable. And, but we know it's like a very predictable process. Like we're comfortable with it. It doesn't seem to be that, right? But there is a part of it, part of the chain of explanation, which is missing. Hmm. Right, and it's it's um, we're we're okay with that. So that's one type of unknowing. The other type of of unknowing, I think, very important that you mentioned, is we don't know the the political, social, cultural effects. Right, hmm. so we don't know what that technology will will do to us. Uh, and I think you're you're very right. It's very important to kind of like experiment and 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 think and and reflect and uh, uh, about what the effects will be. You know, when, when I looked at um, I was reading the papers of Licklider. So remember, Licklider was a Palo Alto research lab. They did the joystick, and the, they did a lot of early, also early, some of the first word processors were developed in this lab. And so they developed, so for example, I remember they developed the copy and paste function. Mm -hmm. And they're like, our mind is blown. You can take a whole chunk of text and like move it to another place. But what I loved, what they did, and which we don't do, is they said, let's experiment with this and have a diary of what that does to our process of creativity. Because we don't know. We don't know what this weird copying and pasting will do to our process of writing. And then there's like this purposeful, let's integrate this into our research. Let's treat it like a natural. It's, it's a system that has complicated and unpredictable social cognitive effects on writing. And so they're like, let's have, there are these cognitive diaries of like, here is how my writing changed because I'm able to very fluently uh, take a piece of text mm -hmm. and move it to a different place. I can cut it apart, I can, I can separate it. So that's, a, and I, I'm like, I love it. We should do more of that. We should kind of have a lab which just does the social, cultural, political experimentations with these new new systems. Well, that r raises an issue that we really haven't talked about, which is, are there going to be bad effects of, of these these systems? And can we think about that and think about what to do about them? I mean, the thing that worries me the most is that, um, you know, with the huge success of OpenAI, every big tech company is making humongous machines, you know? So GPT-3 had 175 billion parameters, and the new Google one is 500. Million GPT-3, I'm sure, GPT-4 will, I'm sure, be even bigger. And the thing is, the bigger they get, the more hidden are the failures. 
So they, you know, they'll be able to, you know, so we, they won't, the failures won't be just so much there out in the open, but yeah. with all the money invested in them, right. there's going to be a lot of pressure to use them. And people are experimenting with um, um, a pixel uh, in, inputs and robotic outputs now. And I think with all the so much money in this stuff now, there's going to be, you know, robots with eyes and, and you know, can do things in the world. And they're going to be powered by these machines that, in some fundamental way, are unreliable. Yeah. I think that's the and, term that Francesca and, used. They don't know, they don't have a world model, they don't know what the facts are, and they can't count very well, and they can't do, you know, I mean, I'm sure that the, you know, GPT-4 or GPT-5 will be really good at small arithmetic problems, but maybe there'll be some other arithmetic problem that it'll, where it'll completely fail. And those things will be used commercially and Yeah, and, and it's, it's not just a matter of being correct or failing. Uh, it's also that these models, that, that they don't know exactly what it means to fail and be correct, but it's also that these models are trained in this way they don't have really a clue of the values that we want to have in our technology when we allow the technology to make decisions or to recommend decisions to a human being. Uh, so they don't know about fairness. So it has been shown that in many examples, these models are biased. So they make they, they say things, they write things in a way that shows that uh, they are biased. And, and that's because there was really no curation of the data that they were trained on. And so, and, and it's not possible to have a curation of that data. Maybe it will be possible by using this two steps approach. Like first you build something like GPT-3 and then you further tune it for a specific task and then you, you try to do the best you can to do bias mitigation in that second step. But in any way, you have to find a way to make sure that they do things or write things in a way that embeds our values. Otherwise, they got not only they, they tell you wrong things, but they tell you things, even when the problem is not right or wrong, but they tell you things in a way that is, I mean, the GPT-3 has been tested in a, in a uh, tested uh, uh, suicide hotline and uh, and somebody interacted saying that he wanted to he was thinking about committing suicide and, and GPT-3 I don't I don't know if it was GPT-3 but the language model responded said you should so we have to be careful about deploying them. First, we have to understand how to embed our values. And I have this uh, uh, you know, feeling that to embed values in these models, you cannot just do it with more data, more computing power, and only a data-driven approach, but you have to combine data-driven approaches with rule-based approaches. Because you know, bottom up and the top down approach. You cannot. I mean, in, you cannot. It's a big word. I'm saying I don't see that emerging for now from a data driven approach only. Well, I, I can push back on that a bit because I especially on the idea how we should uh, we can now actually solve these problems from the uh, using let's say data driven approach in the sense that the 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 set of approaches that we have used so far in order to build these large scale language models, right? is extremely, extremely narrow, in particular when we view the entire field of machine learning or artificial intelligence. So let me just call it, let's say, more of a passive, let's say, machine learning, where the data was somewhat collected with purpose that may not necessarily align well with the purpose of how we use data. And then we try our best with this statistical approach in order to, let's say, count better, compress better, so that the work is going to generalize better. However, that's just a one very narrow sense of machine learning. In fact, you the another side that I would call as, let's say, active machine learning is where we introduce the assumption that these systems are going to actually interact with the other systems or even with the environment. And then with that, of course, we can either make them actually interact with the environments or we can also say that, the, well, here's a set of data set that was collected based on the assumption that there were some kind of interaction that is going to happen in the future. Then you know, we can now start using all those offline reinforcement learning algorithms, active learning algorithms, and even some of the notions from causality and things that are beyond the simple, let's say, statistical approaches come in. And then my sense is that the, it, 
may not have to be role-based, but something that is beyond, but already there are a lot of, let's say, candidate algorithms as well as the sub-disciplines of the machine learning that are being studied, and that have been studied for many years. Like, again, okay, historically, say, you know, the Alan Turing already wrote a lot about the machine intelligence, and one of the things that Alan Turing did mention and emphasize back then, in, let's say, in his writing in the 40s, is the necessity of the reinforcement. So the system interacting with the users or the environments and then get the signal that actually tells the system about what it observes is aligned well with what it's supposed to do. So I, I almost feel like it's not really about the overall data-driven approach, but more like the narrow subset of the algorithms that we have used so far. So what is the limitation of that? And is it possible that we already have some solutions to many of the issues that have been raised with the current generation of language models. Maybe GPT-4 or is going to be trained with something else, or 5, okay, 4 I heard that they already trained it, so maybe 5. I like what you're saying, and one of the reasons why I teach humanists and social scientists and artists all about AI is because I want all of us to have a seat at the table and discuss these things, but one of the most interesting things to me so far is I ask students to come up with these rules, and they're very uncomfortable, and most do not, and they, and they find that they're ethics and their value system cannot be put into rules. Um, and, and so we're going to have to deal with this in an interesting way. And then the question is, whose rules and who decides? right? And can we even decide amongst ourselves if we agree on what these rules are? Um, so I agree with you that um, we want to have a human-centered AI, but I'm not sure it's as easy as just coming up with rules. But isn't it the question to all technology, right? So, and, and what, what you're saying and what, what you've mentioned is, is embedded values are embedded. Uh, okay, what are the embedded values in the automobile, right? Like, look at the effect the roads and cars have had, you know. So, it, it's interesting how we're in this moment. I think because it's called artificial intelligence, we're like, we expect more from you. But other kind of uh, 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 fantastic technologies, like driving, Right? They seem uh, banal and mundane, but yet they have, you know, they like reformed the world, right? The po from, from the politics of energy to the way our cities are structured. And, and also not, I, you know, I can't say that, that accord to my values. Maybe, you know, it's easier to commute, but then at the same time there's pollution. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's the problem where the value was not necessarily embedded in engineering itself, because the engineering often has a specific problem, whereas the political and the social impact has, uh, you know, it's, it, it's immersed in the complexity of like human existence, which is not, you know, it's not rule-based and it's not kind of uh, resolved. One yeah. thing, so I'm glad you raised the point about just the using the phrase artificial intelligence makes us view it one way. One thought experiment I found that kind of helps for me at least is everything GPT-3 and these language, these models know, of course, is things that picked up from human data, right? It's not like a chess program where an, an AI plays an AI. This is a computer learning entirely from human data. So one way to think about it, if everything it knows is from humans, it's really a vehicle for providing access from, to a human to our sort of a mass of, of human knowledge. But we have other technologies that do that, like Google search, even Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a distillation of collective human knowledge that's accessible to an individual. So somehow, you know, I know that Google search actually does use neural networks, but no one thinks of searching Google as talking to an artificial intelligence, and certainly no one thinks of Wikipedia as an artificial intelligence. But somehow thinking of all of these things as ways of taking the mass of human knowledge and projecting it to an individual, GPT-3 is a kind of more stochastic version of that, but at the end of the day, somehow that helps it helps me not think of it as an AI and just think of it as a distillation tool. But it also explains why working with it can be so eerie, because you do feel like you have access to this kind of collective mind of humanity in a, in a really interesting way. And but Google search, I could say the That's same. True. It's, That's you true. get all the toxicity, the misinformation, yeah. the mystery. I mean, Google search is amazing because it's this bizarre window into human creativity. I do think there's also a kind of an existential question that I see with a lot of my students who, who want to be artists, they want to be writers, and they move through these stages of grief almost in working with this, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we thought that robotics would be further along. I, I would love a robot to clean my toilet and make my scrambled eggs, but in fact, that has proven very difficult. And what we found is that, you know, disembodied AI has done, now can do all these intellectual tasks, 
creative tasks. So I think what is most unnerving that we have to somehow come to terms with is that we thought we would have the Jetsons with the robots first, and instead many of us whose entire way of being is based on kind of intellectual work are having to come to terms with the fact that we've actually succeeded there first. Well, I can think of a new rule, you know, all robots must wash their hands before leaving <laughs> yeah. the bathroom. Um, I wanted to say, you know, we all uh, use rules when we speak to each other, right? So language already has rules embedded in it. But one of the things that um, hasn't come up so far is that uh, in the history of human discourse, people make promises and vows and they swear oaths and things that those are all basically language-based behaviors that we don't see or hear so much about and maybe maybe there maybe it's happening I just don't know about it but I think that's such an important aspect of human language generation that we we make promises well one of the um, points that people often make about the large language models is they have no goals um, so you know you can try giving them a goal you can say you know you can you know use text to tell them their purpose but then that's just more text <laughs> that they will then follow with more predictions so um, you know it's another way in which they're really fundamentally unlike human they're whatever kind of mind they have it's fundamentally unlike a human mind okay, I have a question kind of for everybody because you know when I'm looking at the prompt that we were given and you know, there's nothing in there that, that has the words intelligence or mind. And how, and it's interesting to me that throughout, like those words immediately entered our conversation. And in fact, in the research, in the AI research program, from the very beginning, language and intelligence and mind, so language is kind of one of the most marked kind of uh, feature of intelligence. But, you know, we can, th I mean, we, we talked a little bit about vision, we talked a little, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other, so I feel like there's a cognitive linguistic slide that we are engaging in, where we're beginning to speak about compelling language generators, but right away we're saying, okay, is there a mind there? <laughs> or is this, you know, is this intelligent? Whereas, whereas again, we wouldn't necessarily, you know, I don't have the same question to a calculator or to like a more complicated statistical model that whatever, predicts the weather. I don't go like, oh, does it actually feel the weather? Or does it, you know, is it intelligent in that way? So there's something, I mean, I guess it's a question to everybody is why, you know, what world does the, how is the connection between language and mind and intelligence and why are we naturally sliding immediately from language and text into, in, into intelligence and mind? So it's interesting, there are two questions that have been very much prevalent in the literature on this stuff that have not come up up here, and I think there's a good reason for it. One of them is that, is it really intelligence? I, I, I don't myself think that's a very useful question because it's such a vague notion. But here's the other one, which is kind of interesting, which is a lot of the discussion has stemmed from a, a paper by Bender and Kohler, uh, something they call the octopus test. Um, how can, you know, and they, they call these machines stochastic parrots, so just trade on words and it out comes more words, so, you know, you're never getting to the world. And I think for good reason that hasn't come up here, because it's really completely irrelevant. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, what we've, uh, the, the issue of can something trained on more words be in some reasonable sense intelligent, creative, solve problems, do things, it's a kind of non-issue, really. Um, so uh, I think you know there's a good reason why that hasn't come up here, uh, but it has dominated a lot of literature. Mm. Well, but does it uh, haven't the failings that you mentioned at the very outset, the sort of glaring failings where it seems computers don't have a world view? Isn't that no, an example of how intelligence would uh, some some definition of intelligence would would perhaps address that problem? Well. I don't think you can solve it by definition. There are certain, um, maybe we could use a neutral term, intellectual capacities that they do extremely well, better than us, and, other, and others where they don't. So I think we have really focused on, on that issue here of, and, and also trying to understand what, what it is they are doing. 
It, they do seem to know things a little, I mean, we, you mentioned that as well. Um, and that's part of when we do experiments, we're trying to figure out what does it know. Now, do I mean no in a human way? Absolutely not. When you see it fail, those are clues. So GPT-2, the much smaller model, we had a student train it to write MTV Daria episodes. It seemed so. to know the characters. It seemed to know the kind of plots and the ways that people interacted. But it would make really bizarre goose. A person would pick up the phone and then pick up the phone later in the scene. Mm. Uh, somebody stirred lasagna. You know, and you go, oh, don't stir lasagna. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but then, right? And so, but, but the fact that you notice means most of the time it does actually know. And, and so that's the fascinating thing. And we had a creative writer give it a prompt about an inky black sea. It immediately knew that these people were probably on a boat, that they might be fishing, that when they pull up a net, usually what it has in it, it's unusual to have a body, which it did. It knows that the ocean is not made of ink, right? So it does seem to know stuff, and that's what we're experimenting with. I mean, people get upset because it's not knowing like a human, but we're still trying to figure out what it knows and what it doesn't know. Coming back to the steering the lasagna, yeah. I mean, I've never made the lasagna myself, so I can't really tell what it but is. But you never know, maybe, maybe on the web, but there was sure, somebody stealing lasagna. Yeah. 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 You never know what people can do to this uh, recipe. Yeah. But yeah. can people actually make an argument? And, and in fact, this is the argument that uh, quite a few people have been making over the past few years, and then even, uh, just two days ago, David Charma said, and well, you actually made the same argument, is that the, is it possible if the system had a word model, we would expect it not to say lasagna unless it says that you know, it, it was steering yeah. something, right? Yeah. But then another way to think about it is that it, perhaps that actually tells us that the, if the model had a perfect predictive model, then you know, the probability assigned to lasagna in that context would be zero. And then in that case, can we actually say the other way around, saying that, well, look at this amazing predictive model it has that probably implies that it has the word knowledge or the word model in it already. So then perhaps by simply making prediction better and better, or the model's predictive capability better and better, maybe it's going to automatically, we'll have to come up with a word model that's going to reflect how word works and how we work, uh, think and so on. Right? So yeah. Yeah, is it really? Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's why when I say, it cannot, I mean, you cannot say this approach cannot build a word model. Maybe by building a better prediction model, then that would build not an explicit word model that you can see, but then in, in, as a result, uh, the, the result would be as if it, were, it had an explicit word model. Uh, but but uh, yeah, but um, I don't I know. Mean, that, I don't that know. That is the big difference. We can make explicit, we can, we can formulate explicit ideas, right. keep a record of explicit facts, and that's not what these machines do. And I, I, I think the question uh, uh, is, can the kind of compression training that they get give that effect? I mean, I, I, I'm betting on no, myself. I'm betting that there, uh, that there will be that there is something about being able to be ex being able to be explicit. Yes, but of course one could say, um, I mean, being David's advocate, that if one opens my skull and looks inside, it doesn't find any explicit things there, any explicit rule or logic rules or whatever. But then I verbalize my explicit model in some way that says, okay, I know about these rules and this and that, but you don't find the rules by looking inside. So one could say this is similar to these huge machines with a huge number of parameters that what you see if you look inside is just these billions parameters and the values of these parameters that don't tell you, don't tell you anything about this machine having a, a model or not. But, but then by generating the output, maybe you realize that this machine has a word more. So, uh, so in some sense, uh, I see that uh, this doesn't roll out having a word model, even without an explicit characterization of the word model, of the rules uh, that are learned. But um, Well, we just had this example of uh, lasagna stirring here. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's interesting the way in which human, humans sort of curate their own information in a weird way, because it may depend on who the expert is that's teaching them about it. So you had this wonderful reaction. I hate to sound like I'm biased about Italians. 
and what they think about things like lasagna. But when you go, we're not going to, you don't start lasagna. No, I'm it saying. It carries much more weight to me. I'm saying that than, I'm sure there must be somebody in the world that know. steals a lasagna. I'm sure of that. No, exactly. Maybe in this country. But no, so if, you're, so, no, no, so if, you're, if your parent says something to you or someone who you know somehow as a, as a human, this person's advice here means a lot. I'm going to pay attention to it. Yeah. This other person's advice does You know, the, you learn these rules in a very different way, right? Because of this sort of emotional balance and the understanding the worldview about who the expert may be. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting to me is again, we are the kind of problems uh, is being that are being identified in this conversation. They kind of assume <laughs> like a totalizing intellect, and then like, oh, like it, the, the, these are the things that are missing to get to this notion of like the perfect intelligence. And and, and again, there's something about language because le the language pulls in all of the world, and then so we expect it kind of to do better, and we we see this kind of, but they're universal failings. Mm -hmm. We don't expect the same kind of sort of the same kind of, um, what should I say, not hubris, but the same, the same performance from other robots. You know, so, you know, they're amazing robots that build machines and, they, you know, they're, and they, they're using complex statistical vision techniques. We never go like, oh, why doesn't it have a world model of lasagna? Mm -hmm. You know, why doesn't the robot in the, you know, whatever, Tesla factory? Uh, and, you know, so my question would be why? Why is it so? But as soon as we start talking about language de generators, which are often built with the, also, it's a machine, it's built with a particular purpose. We right away want to say, does it have emotion? Does it have intelligence? Why doesn't it understand lasagna? Right, in a way that we don't demand of other machines. But That's by the way, also <laughs> with, with people, no? Like I was raised in Italy, so in a very biased way about what you should do with a lasagna, for example. <laughs> so, so in some sense, I built, during several years, I built like a model of what you should do with that object and what is appropriate and not appropriate to do. I was not raised or trained, you know, uh, with the data coming from all over the world. Maybe if I were trained like that, or if I grew up with data coming from all over the world, for me it would be equally good to steer or to not steer a lasagna. Maybe, you know? So, so uh, and in some sense we are expecting from a, an object that is trained with equally uh, important data from all over the world, so all the different cultures, all the different regions, uh, and maybe there is a lot of contradicting evidence of what you should do with an object. And then, of course, I, I as a person, I could say, well, you could steal or not steal lasagna if I was raised with experiences from all over the world, which I, I did not. You know, I was just raised with experiences from one region of the world. So, in some sense, it's not surprising that uh, there are, you know, contradicting pieces of information that are collected by and, and, and are helping training these machines, and then the machine spits out pieces that are maybe consistent with the sub-part of its information that it was trained on, and not the other one. Well, and to add to what you're saying, we have creative writers who are trying to get it to be creative. So we are tuning the hyperparameters to get creativity, and then we get stirred lasagna. <laughs> so it could be that that stirred lasagna is sampling from the, the surprise, right, as well. I'm going to yeah. try it. <laughs> so, well, yeah. I want to push back on Dennis a little bit. So you're, you're sort of blaming the humans, saying, why do we keep asking for more and expecting more from GPT-3 than other things? And I want to say it's its own fault. It's the computer, not the humans. It's because it bullshits so much, right? If you have a robot that's designed to yeah. assemble a car, that's what it does. But GPT-3 set makes up things about everything and it acts like it knows so much, and it just BSs. Yeah. So yeah, there's some responsibility in human that we look for more, but it's responsible, it vastly outsteps. It's not trained for a purpose. It tries to do everything, and it embarrasses itself. Isn't it, doesn't that make it very human, in a way? Yeah, but with the worst kind of human. <laughs> <laughs> what about these failures that are so funny? You know, we're, we're getting a big laugh out of some of the ways in which the, the generator comes up with these gaffes. Like, what you, is that a clue to anything, do you think, about so, creativity? Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, the, so there are actual genuine, let's say, uh, degenerate cases that arise from the, our current, let's say, practice of training these models. And in fact, there are quite a few people, including my own lab, where 
we actually look into those, let's say, failures and then try to come up with the, let's say, mathematical or statistical, you know, let's say, justification why those failures happen and then how to fix them. But there are so many of them at the moment, <laughs> to the point that they are fixing one at a time, but you know, there is a chance that they, what we really need is a new paradigm of how we train these models rather than you know, fixing every single DGR cases at a time because we're just adding a new term to the loss function every time. Because I, I saw you write in lasagna on your schedule. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first thing I'm doing when I get back. <laughs> yeah. And just to add to the idea that why we are fascinated by language or the language generator over the robots and whatnot is that they, you know, like, do we perceive or interact with the word you know, in many different ways? You know, do we perceive the word by looking at them? You know, do we hearing about it? Sometimes we touch, you know, do we move things? But it, and language is actually yet another medium by which we can interact with the environments, right? So by interacting with the other agents or interacting with the other computers and whatnot. And then I think that one, uh, one unique aspect of the language is that it actually expresses very uh, diverse spectrum of the abstractness. So let's say what we see is extremely concrete. We see what is often there. I mean, there is a bit of hallucination or not, but generally we see what is there. We hear what is actually being, what is hitting our actual eardrum, right? And then we touch things that are like here. Again, you know, beside all those hallucinations, the language is where we can actually express all those as extremely abstract thing, as well as extremely concrete thing in a single, let's say, sentence, single phrase. And I think that that actually makes this medium a very, very unique and fascinating compared to other mm -hmm. things that are being done. Mm -hmm. The other uh, dichotomy we've not touched on is the word, the distinction between sort of syntax and semantics. Uh, that hasn't come up at all. I mean, does anyone want to talk a little bit to that? Well, that's the octopus test that I mentioned. Uh, yeah, so um, look, uh, 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 it depends on what your theory of semantics is, what it is for the machine to know the meanings of the terms. I play uh, a, a, like a, a view called functional role semantics or conceptual role semantics, which says that if the roles of the representations in the machine are the right roles, then it will understand the words. Um, and uh, there's, a, 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 there's a recent paper by Steve Piantadosi arguing uh, for that view. And it uh, seems to me that they have substantial elements of the right conceptual role. So I think there is some amount of understanding of the representation in these machines. Yeah. But if you forget a little bit about the uh, importance, of course, <laughs> the main importance of the content, so the semantics uh, of what is being written, but in terms of the syntax, this is really where the first amazement is is how can these machines, under, without telling them the rules of syntax, can, they can write in such a fluent and eloquent way in, in, in a language or even more than one. You know, that, I mean, to me, was the first, uh, the first my first uh, you know, uh, uh, approach to uh, language generators was this one. Oh my God, is writing you know, in a very eloquent way. Then, of course, if you go and look at the semantics, then you, then you have things to say you know, about the quality of the semantics. But the syntax is really much more amazing than the semantics, I think. You know, the, the, way, I, the way I think about it is, is there is an underlying statistical rep representation of language that, that assigns kind of words and their occurrences to like a, a vector space model. It like looks like the stars, and certain things are likely occur to next, next to other things. So when you say, I want to eat, you know, blank, some things are probable because they, were, they occurred in the training corpus, and some things just ra rarely or improbable rarely occur. So now is that, so when you translate language into a statistical model, this is where I, I begin to think, okay, I, I don't, is that model sentient, is it, does it have semantics? It, it is what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a particular mathematical model that, that represents language in, in a way. So, so I'm actually much more cautious to not go the next step and to say, well, you know, to, to personify it and make a metaphor and kind of animate it, to say like, is it going to do this, this kind of stuff? Uh, I, I just want to add one more anecdote from history, is that uh, the, the paper by Markov, and Markov the, Mar the original Markov chain generator by Mr. Markov, um, which was you know, published in either German or Russian, and then it made its way in translation, you know, which had, you earlier, you had a great explanation. It's like, it's a chain, you know, it looks back, it sees a letter, and then it says, what's the probability? It was letter by letter. 
That paper was on Pushkin. It was on generating Pushkin's prose, and he by hand created like a simple letter by letter generator that produced, and it was also like, it's amazingly effective. It's the simplest mathematical model. It produces like very nonsensical Pushkin, mm -hmm. uh, but, but nevertheless, it was effective, right? It right away got us to like the point where we are saying like, wait a second, uh, this thing is, is producing sentences. It also has the same kind of problems. It ha has difficulty with context, obviously, because it only looks back one letter, mm -hmm. right? So, so these are, you know, so I think it, by, tr by trying to not fall into the same metaphorical, the same kind of language w which we slide into, which is intelligence, mind, you know, uh, sentience, and, and just try to like re restate what we mean in other ways. Like this is a statistical model. Do we say, what do we, how do we talk about statistical models? I think that helps us kind of move past some of the I think last night, you know, we saw some beautiful magic tricks. Like there's some magical tricks here that are in our minds. There, there, there. It's, it's. The, I think there are our failings in the way of, of incorporating these these techniques into our life. This is the last comment, and we're gonna yeah. have questions from the audience. One please. thing that just came to mind, I haven't thought about this previously, is when you think of like the historical context of Turing test. It's kind of an artificial environment, right, where you you blind yourself to the human and the computer. But one thing that's kind of amazing is. You know, over the last 20 years, so much of our interaction is in purely text form, right? I text friends, I type on social media. So we're in this world now where we interact with humans in an entirely text-only way. So when we see something like GPT-3 that I, inter I interact with text-only, I think that's part of why it feels like it's more human, or at least we think of those terms and ask about it, because that's a standard form of interaction now. We don't, you know, if you look at old old school sci-fi was about physical robots because that's our yes. world. Yeah. But now we live in a world of texting yeah. and GPT-3 is yeah. potentially yeah. as real as anything else. It's not, mm -hmm. but that's it's just somehow our world has changed separate from the AI as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we, uh, we have some time for some questions from the audience. Would you like to approach the microphone? Thank you. Okay, thanks for this conversation. It's very interesting. Um, the prompt, as it's stated in the program here, says that the program can create language that gives the impression that it is thinking. And thinking is the thing that I am sort of want to press the circle to, to talk a little bit more about. And it strikes me that um, when computers first arrived, we didn't tend to think of them as violating entropy. You know, you get them to go and then they break and they, you know, uh, they have a lot. Of, they, they require lots of energy and vacuum tubes and all of this. But now, with the rise of like language learning and the sort of artificial intelligence, there's this kind of impression that we have that the computer is somehow like us, violating the second law of thermodynamics. That it's somehow creating centropy and and generating things outside the realm of like the you know the heat death of the universe. I think. And what I'm basically saying is that is the problem with computer thinking basically the same problem we have in understanding our own thinking. Like if we don't understand what consciousness is in the first place, how are we, I mean it seems like there's a really quick move to understand the computer is doing this because it seems to be doing what we do, which is make connections, we're creative, we flourish, we do all these things. But in the end, are we even actually thinking according to, to that uh, model? One, one point doesn't directly address that, but kind of tangential is um, the, the prompt also mentioned something about does being aware of a code kind of affect its realness? <laughs> and I hate to say it, but the fact that, okay, we don't know exactly the black box of machine learning and deep neural nets and all that, but we do understand neural networks in the sense that we've designed the algorithms, we know what a transformer is. And I hate to say it, but the fact that we know exactly what algorithm GPT-3 is running, not you know, the parameters after it's been trained, but the, the raw algorithm, knowing that does take a lot of wind out of the sails. It takes away a lot of the magic. We, I can't look in a human brain and understand it architecturally to the same level that I understand a transformer. So I think part of why it's easier to ascribe consciousness and thinking and sentience and all these things to organic life is we know much less. We don't know everything about neural networks, but we know so, so much that it's really hard to believe it's thinking, that it's conscious, that it's any of these human type of things or animal things. The, um, the idea of amazement, which we brought up so much at the beginning, also seems to me a, a fancy way to talk about that would be to say, 
oh, we observe things with low entropy that surprise us, right? And we've already learned how to do that. And you're right, humans, in our human intercourse, uh, among ourselves, uh, discourse, I think is a better word, whoops, uh, that uh, we, we, we are, we're exposed to those sort of flashes of low entropy that our consciousness can create. Does that mean that, that when computers do it, that's another instance of thinking like humans? I don't, I don't think so, but people may disagree. So again, we don't really have theories necessarily that make sense of the data. And so we are in this experimental phase where we're just, um, you know, one of the frustrations of working on it is you just have to give data point after data point after data point, but we can't necessarily say what it all means. Um, you know, we had one student who was a Bernie Sanders supporter, senior, who decided to have GPT-3 write a, a lullaby by Marx, and it did a beautiful job. And then a conversation between Adam Smith and Karl Marx, and it did a beautiful job. And then, and, and one shot, not, you know, five times. And then, you know, what would Karl Marx say about Bitcoin? And it, it said, well, he might say this. I mean, it was all very, you know, so is that thinking, is it conscious? Of course not. You know. But it is doing something that we recognize that as difficult in terms of intellect, you know? And, and we don't really have a way of, of making sense of that with our current theories. We just have to look at the examples. And yeah, I think the important thing to note here is that the, even humans, right? So whatever we say and you know, whatever the new knowledge that we seem to create does not necessarily actually become important knowledge, but it's always all about looking back, right? Hindsight for, aside is 2020. So you know, we do increase the entropy. You know, whenever we say something, almost everything is going to be forgotten and it's going to be considered noise when we look back on a couple of years back. So we do increase the uh, entropy. But general, and then you know, these machines are the same thing, right? So these models were trained to minimize the entropy based on the data. And then what we know is that the, the entropy of the trained or the learning distribution has to be greater than or equal to the original entropy. So it's always going to increase the entropy. But then the thing is, it all comes down to distillation like process, right? So we look at all those things, and then we pick what are important, creative, amazing things, and then we're going to kind of say, keep them. And then maybe the more important process then this kind of language generation is. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Yes, uh, thank you again for a for great panel. Uh, I have a question. We talk about language like in the literary sense, like putting words together, but I would be curious, what uh, if GPT-3 can uh, formalize and then try to predict mathematical language, and what I'm trying to get at is, you, you know about Gödel's theorem, right, right that like the, the mathematical language of arithmetic is either incomplete or inconsistent, I would be curious if, if a system like GPT-3 can try to do all the combinations that mathematical language can generate, all the possible sentences, and find out a contradiction in arithmetic, which we say could exist, but I don't think anybody has fathomed what inconsistency, inconsistency lurks within arithmetic. I would be curious if, if uh, GPT-3 can be applied to mathematical language. Thank you. So, so the, uh, of course, answer is yes. Some people are actually training these uh, large-scale language models on the formal language or the math mathematics mm -hmm. equations and so on. But I think the one thing that is interesting is we don't even have to go into the incomplete theorem or anything like that. But in mathematics and computer science theory, we all we have a very well-established theory of the hierarchy of the problems problems that we can solve based on the complexity, right? So it could be memory or that could be just a computational complexity. And then one thing we know is that, okay, these language models that we build have a very fixed amount of compute that is assigned to each and every input. So for instance, let's say you know, we're trying to solve traveling salesperson problem, and we know that it is an empty complete problem. And then we know that the GPT-3 or whatnot has only the quadratic complexity with respect to the size of the input, let's say graph size. And then what we know is that the unless, Unless traveling salesperson or the uh, NP turned out to be P, unless that happens, we know that there will be instances of the traveling salesperson problem that cannot be solved by this kind of GPT-3. So I don't think it's about yeah, the training a model better, getting more data, but there are some fundamental computational limitations that are actually being imposed by our own construction. And how to go beyond that is a kind of, let's say, research direction that people are looking into, and they often call it, let's say, universal transformers or whatnot. 
But, but yes, to, to just uh, connect to what you <coughs> said, that uh, yes, these large language models have been uh, further trained to be used, for example, for generating code, which is a special kind of text with some rules because of the coding, or to generate plans, sequences of actions, or to generate other structured tests, other forms of structured tests. And so the way that is done, as we mentioned at the beginning, is that you take this large language model and you further train it for that specific domain, whether it's code or plans or other forms of structured text. Um, so the, not, not related to the computational complexity thing, but, but to say that, yes, this these uh, uh, language generators can be used to generate specific forms of language, such as code, plans, and other things. But it's important to remember, even when you train it to create mathematical language, it's still statistical. It doesn't know when it's right or right. wrong. Right. So no, it's not right. going to find some contradiction, because right. it doesn't know when it's right or wrong right. to begin with. But yeah. don't our students also not know? What's that? Our <laughs> students <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's true. <laughs> We know when they're right. Yeah. <laughs> we think we know when they're right. But actually, failures in logic are, is one of the main tells when you're trying to distinguish right right now, which is very surprising because we think of computers as highly logical, and yet that's precisely what these models fail at. Yeah. Hi. Thank you all for this amazing talk. Um, we talked about world models a bit, and uh, I think it might be interesting to take the view that the success or failure of, a, of an algorithm is actually nothing to do with the algorithm, but rather the human judgment that deploys a, a, in a given context a world model to judge how, what a computer has done. And we mentioned about the continuing progress of, of AI in the future or algorithms, and I can see actually two vectors, one in which, based on how we deploy these in actual real-world systems, we are so used to seeing all this quote-unquote BS that we actually lower our judgment function to say that this is acceptable to us. Or these, we don't have as sophisticated world models to judge the outputs of uh, AI because we're so used to growing up with them. Um, so if, if you have any comments on that uh, point. And the other question I have for all of you is, has coming to the earlier question on uh, what does it say about mind that we started with, uh, has it changed for you how you understand yourselves as human beings? <laughs> That's a song. <laughs> <laughs> On judging the output, look, GPT-3 uh, is about 20% or 20-some-odd percent correct on two-digit multiplication problems. You know, 25 times 72. It can't... It, it's very poor... Uh, uh, you know, that's, come on, that's not a, by human standards, that's not a particularly sophisticated kind of issue. So, you know, the, the, the failures are, are severe. Um, and as, uh, as we were discussing earlier, I think the key issue is, is this a matter of different kind of training, bigger models, uh, you know, more training? Um, I'm sure that, that, that some future model will be much better at, at these arithmetic problems, but will there still be, you know, some uh, astonishing failure in some kind of uh, mathematical, logical thing? But, uh, I mean, to answer the question, I think the answer is yes. I mean, because we, you've seen also in this discussion that we always often do these analogies, and so whenever we try to um, test or even analyze or discuss these large language generators, we always, or AI in general, we always think, at least I always think in terms of human beings, you know, we learn from data, we learn from examples, we learn from rules, we learn, we abstract from data to rules, so, and that thinking about how humans do and reason, uh, it's trend translated in, in our, for example, in my work, in my research project, is translated, my understanding of how humans do things is then translated and tries to be adapted into the AI space. So like, uh, I don't know, for example, my, my recent project is about thinking fast and slow in AI. So to take that uh, cognitive theory of how human make decisions by combining the thinking fast and the thinking slow and see what it would mean inside a machine. What is the thinking fast? It's just machine 
data-driven approaches is the thinking fast, or does it also generate then uh, emerging thinking slow behavior, or you have to add the thinking slow behavior because it doesn't emerge from there. So uh, uh, in my job, I always do this, that uh, analog analogy between humans and machines or differences that certainly helped me in, in recent years, well, you know, to understand better how human minds works as well. Can I also say, when, when I confront questions like this, I'm reminded of the old distinction between kind of functional, like, is the proof going to be in the outward uh, representations of intelligence, or is it going to be in the inward, some kind of inside structure that, you know, there's a long philosophical tr tradition in thinking about it, but I myself am skeptical uh, about these algorithms telling us anything kind of internally, uh, kind of any answering existential questions about the mind or God or love or whatever, whatever it is. But functionally, I, and functionally I think the, the answer to, you know, what effect, what will these algorithms teach us, that's not a, a speculative question. It's a question of how will these algorithms will be integrated into our daily practice. And I think that's, that's a matter of observation, that's a matter of engineering. Um, one example I'll give you is that I guarantee you, all of you who teach, our students will be using these algorithms, they're already using these algorithms to write fairly mediocre, like C plus, B minus papers, because it's so easy. You can right now go to a website, put in a bunch of like really good papers and produce like a somewhat nonsensical, but you'll be like, oh, that's an interesting idea. I never thought of that, you know, B minus. Now, that <laughs> changes, that changes my, I mean, maybe, hopefully not at Columbia, but uh, that changes my um, practice of teaching. That means mm -hmm. when I sign papers, mm -hmm. I can no longer view a paper as, as this like special insight into my students' ability to comprehend something. Because I know now that the, the student is thinking with a computer uh, in a hybrid way, in the way we've, we've always been doing, but now the computer is playing more of a part. So now, and this is, I, I don't have an answer by the way, now I'm thinking, okay, to, to be in front of this train, can I give them, and I love your, the various experiments your lab is doing, can I give them papers and say, actually, <coughs> explicitly write, write them with GPT, in some way, and then show me kind of what, what is the next student paper format? What is it going to look like? And I think it's going to be something different post, but because, because these algorithms are unreasonably effective, because they're magical and they're, they seem to surprise us in a particular way, that means they will transform our practice of teaching in this, in this example. I think that's excellent, yes. Well, I hope my own internal language generator uh, <laughs> chooses the following word. I think this was a stirring conversation and a uh, wonderful one at that. Oh, we have another question? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, my goodness. Now, I, I so hope I you will speak. not call the wagon and have me sent to the loony bin for what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, I'm a Jungian psychoanalyst, and part of what we do is we... we um, try to learn all the mythologies of the world, which is of course impossible, but get trained in mythopoeic approaches, mythopoeic, analogous, associative approaches. And the way you're talking about what's in the computers is the same way we approach dreams. I'm really so struck by this because a person could have a dream that Egypt was sent over to the Golden Gate Bridge. And we would look to see what the unconscious associations are. Is this a person who's putting great value in renewal of life out of an Egyptian system, but is drawn to commit suicide <coughs> and thinks about doing it on the Golden Gate Bridge? So then you look at all the underlying associations. So my fantasy is, in some weird way, because you are all trained so well in rational thought that the unconscious, associative, mythopoeic level is getting picked up in some way. And so just, just think about it, but <laughs> consider it, which means look at it from the point of view of the stars. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again, everyone. And uh, we will be reconvening uh, at 2 p.m. For our talk on the metaverse. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.